counsel for prosecution has entered a motion to dismiss, and I have no other option but to dismiss. Now, if you want to countersue him, that's another case. Well, I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm, I told him, will you be quiet and submit your bill? Submit your bill. You won. Submit your bill for your damages. So he did. He said, well, I'll submit my bill in your honor for my costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous case. And the judge smiled because people don't usually do that. But if you win, they are required to pay you. That's the rules. If you lose, you pay. So the bottom line is this. When you file your papers and they turn around and you, you, you get a win, make sure you got your little bill in there for, for your lost time from work or any copies that you had to make or any visits to the law library or any what is called real and personal damages. And don't pad the account. Put down exactly what you got because if they force you to prove it, you can get busted for perjury. So I don't, I don't recommend you, 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 shall we say, stretch the pad. I recommend you put down exactly what your costs are. Believe me, the fact that they got beats plenty enough of a sting, and the fact they got to pay a couple hundred dollars for your lost day at work will be more of a sting. And you will not, you will get a code on your license. And the next time you get pulled over, they will just hand your license back and tell you to think about slowing down and have a nice day. Because they don't like people like you. Because you're an American. And Americans don't give up. They, they never surrender and they fight. One judge told me one time, he said, you got any kind of idea how much money you've cost this court today? And I said, I hope it was a bunch, Your Honor, because I hope you got to go write a whole bunch more tickets to break even. The way I figure, the more tickets you got to write, the sooner the public's going to wake up to this uh, theft, and maybe they'll start uh, doing something positive to stop this kind of stuff, because it's my, my belief they should be having masks on out there, because, I mean, if they was an honest crick, they'd be having a mask on there when they robbed the people. Okay? Well, he didn't... He didn't like that answer too good, but the bottom line is he, he knew I was right, and after a while they realize what your goals are, and they know, hey, this is more fun than Edgewater Park, and I want to go on all the rides twice. You know what I mean? I want to hit the wild mouse and a whole bunch of them other rides. Let's do it. And see, when they see that, they realize there's no point. You're not going to learn anything. You're going to cost some time, money, and materials. Now the, the, the system is not profitable. Okay. So they back off. They put a code on your license. They won't bother you anymore. Now, did everybody see we t uh, take that line down? We take the line from the Constitution. We take the line from the right. Now, let's think up another right. How about the right to work? Contract your labor and your skill and your time of life as you see fit. Now, your right to work is protected by the Constitution under the First Amendment. Again, you have a right to work and contract your labor and your skill and your time of life as you see fit. I get hauled into court before uh, the chief judge of this big court here in Oakland County. I won't give you the judge's name because he was a fair judge and a good judge, and I'm going to let him slide. But the bottom line is this. He looked just like Abe Lincoln. I mean, exactly. He was the spitting image. And he leans over the chair, and he says, Well, he says, uh, It's been reported to me, son, that you don't have a license to practice law. Is that correct? And I looked up at him, and I said, Judge, I'm not practicing. I know what the hell I'm doing. And the whole court broke out laughing. He said, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I like somebody with a sense of humor. He said, but that doesn't change anything, son. You have to have a license to practice law. And I said, Your Honor, I'm an unenfranchised common law free man. I live at the common law. I am not a participant in any tontine schemes of limited liability on a joint venture for profit with an insurable interest requiring me to participate in these illegal corporate Ponzi schemes. I am just Joe Blow from Kokomo down on the street. I just live at the common law. And I have a right to work and contract my labor, my skill, and my time of life as I see fit, not as some third-party arbitrary and capricious bar association sees fit. And they had loaded the court with all these attorneys. And they were, oh, you hear that guy? I said, Your Honor, the state of Michigan arbitrarily and erroneously converted my right to work into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it. That's unconstitutional, Your Honor. Marbury v. Madison, 5 U.S. 137, 1803. Anything in conflict or repugnancy is null and void of law. Okay? Can you see that? Marbury versus Madison. And since the state converted my right into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it, Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama says I may ignore the license and the fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means you can't punish me. In U.S. versus Bishop, 412 U.S. 346 defines willfulness as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. I submit, Your Honor, I couldn't have done an evil task because I was totally following the Constitution in the U.S. Supreme Court. I would submit that prosecution counsel's burden is to prove that I did willfully and knowingly avoid a known duty or task under the law, namely to get the license. 
And I would submit he's specifically precluded. He cannot perform his task. And therefore, I'd motion for dismissal with prejudice failure to state a cause of action for which relief can be granted. And I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous, spurious complaint. The judge rolls back in his chair with a great big smile, and he turns to counsel for the prosecution. He says, well, Mr. Rose, what do you think we ought to do about this young gentleman? The prosecution bounces back. How about we honor the motion to dismiss, Your Honor? The judge says, good answer, because I don't think you're ready for this kid today. And the whole court broke out laughing. An old gentleman walked up to me and he said, Son, I just want to shake your hand and tell you, you got to have like King Kong. Because you just slammed the Bar Association right into the ground. On top of that, I've been an attorney for 57 years, and I just want to shake your hand, sir, and tell you that that was one of the most magnificent arguments that I've ever had the privilege to hear in a court of law. Now, he was an honest attorney, and he realized what kind of a chain was around his ankle with this bar association. And these lawyers, they resent that. They really do. And they're people just like you. They don't like to have any chains on them. But they hadn't had anybody quite show them how to get those chains off. And when they saw somebody do it in their own skill, with their own, you know, with their own cards, on their own playing field, it actually impressed the hell out of them. I had several gentlemen come up and shake my hand that day. Needless to say, the case was dismissed, and I've been helping little people getting jammed for years. Every time I see some little person get jammed, I'm out there flipping that wrench. Zingy, zingy, zingy. And I flip that wrench on them so good that usually they just back off. Dr. Kevorkian was a perfect example. The poor man was uh, just trying to help these poor people. They were jamming him every which way he would lose. So what we did is we taught him a thing called quo warranto. I got a hold of his attorney and submitted all of the arguments. Let me bring that up here. Quo warranto. We brought it in here. Let's see. Go to a pause here for just a second. Oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. Quo warranto. Let's bring that up next. All right. Now, we're going to bring up several arguments right here. We're going to bring up police powers, and we're going to bring up quo warranto. Quo warranto is a basic right that goes back to English law, ancient English law. Okay, here it is right here. All right, quo warranto. Let's read it. Quo warranto. In old English practice, a writ in a nature of a writ of right for the king against him who claimed or usurped any office, franchise, or liberty to inquire by what authority he, he supported his claim in order to determine the right. It lay also in the case of a non-user or long neglected no, long neglect of a franchise, franchises corporation, or misuser or abuser of a franchise, being a writ commanding the defendant to show by what warrant he exercises such a f corporate franchise, having never had any grant of it or having forfeited it by neglect or abuse. A common law writ designed to test whether a person exercising power is legally entitled to do so. An extraordinary proceeding, prerogative in nature, addressed to preventing a continued exercise of authority, unlawfully asserted. Johnson v. Manhattan Railroad Company, New York, recorded at volume 289, United States, page 479. Now, it is intended to prevent exercise of powers that are not conferred by law and is not ordinarily available to regulate the manner of exercising such power. Now... What we did, see, police powers are defined as the right of eminent domain of a state or political subdivision to enact laws for the common good and welfare. Let's pull that out. Police powers. Everybody got that? Police power, right here. Let's do police power. Right here. Police power. This is out of Black's Law Dictionary, folks. An authority conferred by the American constitutional system in the 10th Amendment, U.S. Constitution, upon the individual states and in turn delegated to the local governments through which they are enabled to establish a special department of police, right? Such laws and regulations as tend to prevent the commission of fraud and or crime and secure generally the comfort, safety, morals, health, and pr prosperity